thank you for that tip. Okay, so uh, so we'll uh, thank you for that tip. So uh, welcome back, everyone. We're uh, starting the recording from from this point in the lecture. Um, we're into um, a uh, discussion at this point of Homer's Odyssey book 11. I'm going to share the presentation. We're, uh, we've already looked at a discussion of the cosmos time. And now we're going to skip ahead to a discussion of Homer, background of Homer. So thanks again. I forget uh, the name of the person who pointed that out to me. So, uh, so Homer's writing uh, after the Bronze Age collapse of uh, of the end towards the end of uh, of the 12th century BCE. Um, he's uh, so he was probably writing in the 8th century BCE. So after the Bronze Age collapse, they, they had had a system of writing called Linear B in the Mycenaean uh, uh, palace civilization uh, uh, at that, that in that Bronze Age culture. That was lost, kind of knowledge of writing was lost. They, they, uh, they survived, the story survived through oral transmission, we assume. And um, the stories of potentially a, a, a genuine war of some sort that occurred in, in what uh, in, in what is now Asia, uh, Turkey, but Asia Minor. Um, and these stories are passed down in um, through what, what's called oral formulaic composition. So, um, so I have the long patchworks of stories that I know. I know there's that story that I mentioned earlier of of Odysseus descending to the underworld. So that's a great nugget there. And I've got, and I've got that great story of, of Odysseus with the suitors. And I've got a story over here of, of uh, Telemachus, his son. And so, so I, I'm not gonna memorize every line of it, but I have a general sense of these, these story sequences and a certain sense of the details that, that, that are, um, important for them. And I'm going to need to recite these orally at, at a palace or at, uh, at uh, say a smaller, more humble gathering. And what's useful there is for these retellings is, as I said, you, it's not gonna be memorized, but they did have a great memory to be able to kind of remember all the important story, story elements uh, would, would be certain oral epithets such as um, swift footed for Achilles, because maybe I, I want to call Achilles swift Achilles if I only need that many syllables for that line. But if I need another, another syllable or two, I get swift footed Achilles um, or gray eyed for Athena. So there, there's these marks uh, that we see in Homer that we see in current oral cultures of these, these epithets for characters and other, let's say, tricks of oral formulation. So that leads scholars to believe that Homer's stories were originally um, uh, passed down orally. And maybe Homer is the one who wrote them down. Maybe they were written down after Homer. Now, the other question, <coughs> pardon me. The other question with Homer is um, we have um, two, uh, two differing views on whether or not uh, there's one Homer, there's one poet who composed these, or whether or not there's the, the works are all too disparate. Um, so the Unitarians say there's one Homer, and the analysts say that there's you know there's it's too disparate and they're it's cobbled together from different streams. I don't think we really have enough evidence. My gut is when, when, you know I've read the, the the two works fairly closely a number of times and. And there's such structural integrity to them, you know, in terms of, of the mirroring of and balancing of one half to the other and, and, and mirroring books and, and, 
and it, it's it seems to me that there's kind of the hand of one author behind it, but uh, as I said, there's there's many views on this. So I, as I mentioned, the other the other topic I want to address today is 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 epic, and uh, so we want to define epic, and I'll go quickly over the context of of uh, of Homer's works. So. So we'll see epic here, we'll see it in the Aeneid, we'll see it in Paradise Lost. And, and generally, a quick way would be to think of it as a long narrative poem. So it's long, it's not, you know, it's not a short work, it's not uh, it's not you know, like a lyric poem or a short story. And, and that, that means in, within the tradition, it's meant that it's tried to take on an almost encyclopedic scale, that it's tried to take on in the telling of the tale, let's try to, let's try to encapsulate almost everything that's important about that that culture um it's narrative so it's not lyrical poetry it tells a story and there is a plot to it it's not dramatic so it's not a it's not a play um and it's a poem so it's not prose it's it's in structured lines so there's these i'll talk a bit about some epic conventions so conventions again are, are things that are are by agreement okay so it's a convention that uh people shake hands it's not a natural thing to do when you meet someone but it's a convention that people say hey nice to meet you i'll shake your hand that'll probably change you know uh as we go back post covid people will be more reluctant to do that but that's a convention as opposed to something that's by nature so to speak so in genres so literary cultural works there are conventions something that the audience and the authors or the or the creators the director if it's a film they they have kind of an agreement to of if if i do this as a director i i know that you'll expect this and if i do this i know you'll understand this so so in a sitcom you know i i haven't watched any for a long time but in the sitcoms there were conventions about what is a sitcom you know it's it's about 22 minutes long right if you take away the commercials it's uh it, there's usually some some friends or, or 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 couples that are that are genuinely bound together by by good strong relationships. But there's a you know a little bit of a trouble, and there's lots of one line jokes that have to be sprinkled in throughout. There can't be just one funny moment and a lot of drama. There's got to be every thirty seconds. There's got to be a one liner and a joke in there, and then by the end of the episode, everything should be resolved. Okay, unless it's a rare two-parter. Okay, so these are sitcom conventions, and if you depart from that, then you know you're you're probably, you know, you're not going to get on the on the on the big network, so to speak. You know, and it's not a big genre now. I know. Um, so epic has different generic expectations and conventions. One was in, in medius res, so there the story would begin in the middle of things. Uh, so we'll we see that in the Aeneid. <clears throat> so they begin, uh, so we see that in uh, the Aeneid, we also see that in the Odyssey, which is kind of, say, right in the middle of, of the crisis of, of, of what's happening on Ithaca and with Odysseus. And it's only through Odysseus's flashbacks, the narrative that he gives to the Phaeacians, and we read chapter 11, which is part of that, that we find out about the events that came before. And then we have prophecies of what will happen in the future. So and this is kind of like we find ourselves in our life okay so we find ourselves in life all the time in the middle of things we find that we're we're in the middle of of a life right you know things have happened before us and and i can narrate that i can i can try to weave together a story of how i got here you know well you know i was this kid and this happened and well thank goodness this happened because that really set me straight and now I'm here and you know looking ahead there's a couple of dangerous paths but if I pick this one I think this is where we'll go okay so one's life in a way mirrors epic so the narrative structure of epic and as I'll just note here that the other two epics also have these these segments of, of narration of the past that, that that get us up to speed there's an invocation of the muse I won't read this but there's every epic begins by invoking the help of the muse so that the poet can tell stories that the poet has no would otherwise have no idea of how these things happened like 
how does the how else would the poet know that it was Jove that did this or Ju um, Zeus that did this uh, or or that Poseidon is the one that uh, that kept uh, Odysseus from reaching home. It's only because he's inspired by the muse that he knows these things. <clears throat> there's a <clears throat> there's a proem, so it's a, the 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 uh, the, pre, the first uh, uh, lines of the of the epic, the introductory element of the epic, that set out kind of in all these epics they set out very, right off the bat the subject of the epic in the first lines. Uh, the who or, or the what of the story and the cause of the suffering that got us there. So uh, there's, uh, you know, in, in the Odyssey, it's sing this, sing of the man. You know, the first word of the Odyssey is, is man in Greek. And the man of twists and turns, Polytropos, so, which is Odysseus, and who is driven off course. And, and, and thus he's, he's seeking his home, Nostos. And the cause of the wanderings, and then it turns out to be the rage of Poseidon. So I won't go through here, these, but in each case, you can map that parallel structure in the proem of each of these epics. So there's the Odyssey that I just talked about, the Iliad, it's the subject is the wrath of Achilles, which brought countless ills to the Achaeans, and the cause was the uh, and which of the gods was it that set them on to quarrel? It was the son of Jove and Leto, Apollo. And the Aeneid will read that next week. So, so you might want to refer to that again for this. <clears throat> Other conventions, journeys to the underworld, and that's exactly what we read today. So catabasis, that's a, a Greek word for, for that, a going under. Enumeratio is a, a Latin word for, for an epic list. So again, with the encyclopedic nature of these epics, um, the, uh, one feature that you'll see a lot in, 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 in all of them will be these long catalogs. So in, in the Iliad, the list of of, <clears throat> of the of the uh, te, uh, of the ships that are um, uh, the, the the ships that were sent to Troy. Uh, maybe it's a, a genealogy. All of these things. I have a question here. It's a good question. Do we need to remember all these words? No, you don't. But it's uh, but but but. but if, if, if you're interested in any of them, you can follow them, which is why I give them to you. So you don't have to remember, there's not gonna be a quiz on these, right? You know, there's not a quiz at the end. So you take what, take what you, you find interesting for your reflections on it, right? And, and you, you make that part of your own, okay? Um, very good question. Uh, epic similes. So uh, normally we have uh, in a simile, love is like a red, red rose. Okay, so so the member simile is using like or as to make a comparison of two unlike things. <clears throat> so that's a very simple simile. So I've used like to compare love and a red rose. Uh, so in, and I just invented this one, but uh, so in in epic because it's encyclopedic, you want to use the the the, the nature the, the nature of the simile to take something. Let's say the hero's current circumstance to draw a whole picture and a whole world that you can compare it to and, and, and draw the nuances out of. So as the roses that bloom on the side of that hill where the great philosopher would oft walk while dispersing on, uh, I can't see that, on, on free will and not for long forgetting that higher calling of a preordained root, love blossomed in her and in, in her in seeing the sight of so what you need in, in those is, is the as and the so too, okay? So just as this, so too that. So that's the epic simile structure. So, you, so watch for that when you're reading both this and the Indian. Here's a, a, an example I like from book nine of, of the Odyssey. So just previous to the sec section I asked you to read, um, so he's talking about, uh, well, we, we talked about it quickly, the, about the incident with Paul Femus, the, the Cyclops. So straightforward. So, okay, so he, they're trapped. So he's got the, they, um, they get him drunk. And they, uh, while he's laying out, passed out, they take this, uh, basically this long, long spike, this long log that they've sharpened, they get it red hot, and they poke his eye out to blind. Okay, so. 
Straight forward, they sprinted, lifted it, and rammed it deep in his crater eye. And I leaned on it, turning as a shipwright. So I, I highlighted as. So as a shipwright turns a drill in planking, having men below to swing the two-handled strap that spins it in the groove, so with our brand we bored that great eye socket while blood ran out around the red hot bar. Eyelid and lashed were seared, the pierced ball hissed broiling and the roots popped. And now there's no just as, but imagine just as in a smithy, one sees a white hot ax head or an adze plunged and wrung in a cold tub, screeching steam, the way they oft make iron hard, hail and hard, just so that eyeball hissed around the spike. So I, there's so much going on there in those in that simile. There's so, such a world of imagery. He's really brought down like two different realms of artisanal art, like a shipwright and a blacksmith. So people that might have been listening, their worlds all of a sudden. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So I can really relate to that now, and and um, and almost see what's what's happening. So in this case, it's really the visual imagery that stands out. Uh, Epic of Gilgamesh is the first one. I won't go into this, but it's it's an early, our, our earliest surviving work of literature, but it's early, early epic as well. Doesn't share all the conventions I just mentioned. The mythic background of the stories of Homer, both the, his Iliad and his Odyssey, are is the judgment of Paris. Okay, so so there's this uh, this apple that said uh, this um, uh, wedding feast of uh, I forget which uh, which mythological character uh, is is tossed into this wedding feast and it says to the fairest and of course uh, the, the god of these three goddesses say oh it must be me so Hera uh, 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 Zeus's wife and um, and and Athena uh, goddess of wisdom Zeus's daughter um, uh, Aphrodite. Uh, goddess of love, beauty. So they all they all think it's to the to the fairest must be her. Zeus wants no part of this. You know they go okay, Zeus. You know figure it out. He wants <clears throat> he wants no part of this, and uh, and says okay, Paris, you do this. So he, he sends it to this poor shepherd guy, Paris, and uh, uh, so Paris is forced to choose. They each offer him uh, quite. Uh, quite uh, 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 bountiful gifts if they choose, uh, if they choose uh, each one. So Hera was, was kind of world dominion. Uh, 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 Athena would, was, was military might uh, and prowess and, uh, and, and Aphrodite promised him the, the most beautiful woman in the world as his wife, which happened to be Helen of Sparta. So uh, he picked, which is very un-Greek of him. Okay, so he's a Trojan. Okay, so the Greeks are. It's kind of a, a, a sideline at the Trojan. So the the uh, he picked the beautiful uh, wife, and uh, so he uh, this leads to him abducting Helen from Menelaus of Sparta, which sparks the Trojan War. Okay, so Helen is abducted to Troy. Menelaus' brother is Agamemnon, this powerful ruler of Mycenae, but also kind of all the other city states have to kind of um, uh, follow his lead because of the hold he has over that civilization. Um, and uh, this is, uh, as, as Christopher Marlowe was to say uh, thousands of years later, uh, this, in that way, Helen was the face that launched a thousand ships. So a thousand ships lead, lead for Greece to Troy and that starts a 10 year siege. So the, the Iliad begins when the war has already been going for 10 years and begins due to the anger of Achilles because his um, his war prize Perseus has been, uh, has been taken from him by Agamemnon. Um, he gets back into the fighting after his dear friend Patroclus is uh, killed at the hands of Hector, goes into incredible wrath just in rage of wrath, uh, uh, killing uh, Trojan heroes left and right, ends up battling the river, the, the, the god of the river, uh, and finally slays Hector in single combat. And the, it ends with some touching scenes with old Priam, 
Hector's father sneaking into the Greek camp in great peril and convincing Achilles to give, um, give back Hector's body. He had been mistreating Hector's body, dragging it around. He pierced, pierced the Hector's feet and bound him to his chariot and rode, rode him around the walls of, of, of Troy. And, and then they, they you know, uh, disabused the body quite severely in, in the Greek camp as well. So Priam convinces him to do that. So we have this kind of note of compassion, I guess, out of this wrathful Achilles character at the end. Contrast that with the ending of Aeneid that we'll talk about, okay? So here's just to situate yourself here where it is on the map, Troy, um, uh, on, as I said, on the shores of, of what is now Turkey. And uh, here, you know, Sparta, my, uh, Mycenae would be around here um, uh, and, and, and ships from all these cities in this region. Ithaca is up here, that's where Odysseus is from. So um, in the Odyssey, what have you missed? Okay, so you just started in book 11 in the Odyssey. Uh, from books one to four, it's often called the Telemachia because it starts in Ithaca. So our first presentation is of the urgency of, Ithaca, of Odysseus coming home. Why? We're presented with the problems that are, are mounting there. We're presented with the fact that we have uh, 100 suitors that are, that are wasting away all of the food and wine and uh, of, of, of the palace. Uh, they will, will not go away. They will not take a hint. Uh, Penelope has used her famous trick of, of weaving and unweaving uh, 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 cloth uh, every night so that uh, um, she can delay having to choose one of them. But the situation has gotten critical and tell them, Telemachus uh, has to take a, a journey to try to find his father. Uh, so in the first four books, we see him meeting uh, 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 several heroes from the Iliad. So Nestor, he meets Menelaus and Helen who have been reunited and they tell him of, of, of Agamemnon and, and others. And, uh, and, but none of has, have seen Odysseus recently. We see Odysseus for the first time in book five He's on the island uh, Ogidja, I believe it's called, uh, with uh, Calypso. So Calypso is, um, has, has forced him to stay on this island with her for seven years now. He, when we first encounter him, he's, he's looking out to sea, longing to see even the fires of uh, the smoke in the distance of his, his home. Uh, uh, just, and he's been, as I said, pining there every day for, for seven years. Um, book six to eight show him getting to Phaeakia. So finally, he's on this island for seven years and, and Hermes is sent by Zeus to convince, uh, to, to tell Calypso that she has to let him go. Um, uh, so she does finally release him. He makes his way to Phaeakia. Um, but as I said, his ship is, uh, his ship is destroyed in a storm, Poseidon has one last go at him. Um, and uh, he, he barely gets there alive on, on you know, shards of wood. Um, and books nine to 12, he's still in Phaeakia. He's in be, being hosted by the king there, Alcinous, and they're around the fire and there's a, a rhapsode there. So it's a, a poet telling tales of Troy and, and, and whatnot. And, and, then, and then Odysseus tells his tale of what happened. So he, he finally reveals who he is, that he's Odysseus and, and says, okay, well, I've done all this and I've had some great journeys after Troy. Um, and as I said, book 11 is, uh, is uh, one of, one part of that discussion, one part of that narrative. Books 13 to 24, the second half of the Odyssey. So what we, what we see in book 11 is really this kind of hinge point between what, what came in the first half and then the last half, which is this Ithacan uh, uh, Odysseus. Uh, so in the first half, his, his challenges are monsters and uh, the gods and uh, they're, 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 at a, they're at a supernatural level. In the last, 
uh, 12 books, it almost seems domestic and it seems like it could be boring. It, the narrative pace makes it anything but, but it, 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 the problem is more, more human. He has to kind of secure his home. He has to convince his, his wife, his son, that, that it's, it's, it's actually him. He's been gone for 20 years, 10 years during the Trojan War and 10 years of wandering. So I won't go through all this, but this is, as he relates this, this is the order of his journey uh, that he relates during books nine to 12. So he talks about going to the land of the Lotus Eaters, the Cyclopes, Circe's Island. The underworld is about the middle of the wanderings. Afterwards, he has to go back to Circe's Island to bury Alcurnor. He's got to go through the Sirens. He goes through Scylla and Charybdis. He's, he's kind of to, uh, to uh, equally dangerous, uh, dangerous uh, uh, menaces in the sea. He has to go to the Isle of Helios, and this is fateful uh, and, and prophesied by Tiresias. And then that's when he goes to the Isle of Cal Calypso and ends up staying there for seven years. And it's kind of that point I want to really raise and, and maybe close with here. You know, uh, it's a uh, it's this notion of the ordering of his chronological story and where in the narrative order, as we read the book, the, the Odyssey, we see the events depicted in book 11. So book 11, the, so it's called the Nequia or the Catabasis. It's this uh, descent into the underworld. Um, it's, uh, it's the, these descents into the underworld are, are it's something you see in a lot of uh, literature in, in, in it across uh, several cultures and, and seems to have arisen in the time of the agricultural revolution. Okay, so 12,000 years ago, uh, there's, there's, there's uh, let's say, connections to the sense that in burying uh, the grain, we, we see kind of the death and rebirth of life. Okay, so if there's a, a, a cyclical pattern of the seasons that's emulated there, okay? So the this, this seed that goes dormant in the winter that, that, that springs forth to life again is replicated in, um, in the myths and, and agricultural deities that are worshiped in these uh, cultures, okay? So there's a certain element to that. There's a certain element of the notion of being of rebirth psychologically as well. So the hero goes in, uh, descends to the underworld in these myths. There's a certain aspect of them that they have to go, uh, they have to leave behind. So, so one way that's sometimes described is Odysseus will have to leave behind his warrior aspect so that he can go back and be, you know, the Ithacan Odysseus, the, the husband, the father, the ruler of that, uh, of that community. Um, so there's that psychological element and the way it's situated in the, the book, uh, about the halfway part, it makes sense, okay? So, so it makes sense that we, we had just dealt with uh, kind of warrior uh, Odysseus battling monsters larger than life and now returning to home is the second half. What it doesn't, what it, what, what it tells us though, is that that only makes sense in the narrative, narrative ordering of the events, okay? So in the actual story order, if you look at the bottom of this slide, the, um, the trip to the underworld happens much earlier, right? So the actual trip to the underworld happens and then some other things happen. Then he goes to the Isle of Calypso, stays there for seven years, okay? And then he's on the Isle of Phaeacans, which is where we, are in, in book 11 in reality. Um, and it's only that we're in the underworld in book 11 because we're narrating the past, right? So in the actual unfolding of his sto story, his story as lived, um, uh, the underworld is not, let's say, a defining feature that separates kind of old Odysseus from one that's ready to return to Ithaca. But in the narrative retelling and shaping and this is again, if we compare it to oneself, you know, one's own life. This is the importance of our narrative shaping of our own life. Like maybe in the actual ordering of the events, uh, 
uh, maybe some things happened this way or that way, and maybe it wasn't quite as important as it was when you reflect back on it. But that narrative reshaping is as important, probably more important than let's say the actual details and ordering of, of what happened. It's the narrative reshaping is, is, is what gives it meaning uh, after the fact. So uh, um, just uh, as I said, when, when we encounter him, he's, he he's rejects more immortality and, and thereby accepts the human condition of finitude. Uh, the other kind of temporal theme I want to highlight there is the kind of the permanence of, of the marital relationship that is at, at threat. Okay, it's at threat at the hands of the suitors. It's at threat at the hands of the temptations to, to Odysseus to not return home. It's at threat in terms of the story of Agamemnon. So, uh, so in the underworld, um, he hears uh, a number of, uh, uh, well, he meets a number of these ghosts. He goes there, he has to go there because he has to see Tiresias. So he sees Tiresias after Alpinor uh, he, Tiresias warns him that uh, he, he could, could have two possible futures, that he could go straight away home, or he could, if they uh, are not uh, careful when they get to Helios, the island of Helios, with Helios sacred cattle, if they touch that cattle, then they're going to be, all of them will be killed except for Odysseus and Odysseus will take much longer to get home. So that's in fact what happened. When Tiresias says it, he's prophesying two possible futures. As it's narrated, it's already happened. So narr um, prophecy as narrated becomes fate. The prophecy as it was in the story are possible futures. Um, as narrated, it has become fated. It's already happened, okay? Um, so he sees his mother, a touching scene, inflames him to want to go home more. She says she died of a broken heart. So the other thing to point there is that we see in the, in the underworld, we see uh, uh, ghosts that tell him of things that happened in his past that he's not aware of, like figures from his past that who's whose outcomes he was not aware of, like his mother, he didn't know that she, she had passed away, Alpinor, Agamemnon. He was not aware that, that Agamemnon passed away. And he also has this kind of prophecy of his possible futures, which, as I said, have already become fated. So again, this temporal, this temporal back and forth between past and future that is part of our lived experience. Now, the Agamemnon tale, I want to just again, underscore this in connection with the Penelope permanent that, uh, issue that we talked about, like the, the story of uh, Agamemnon keeps coming back in the Odyssey. Uh, so Telemachus heard of it uh, in, in, in the first books. Uh, um, and so did, um, uh, again, Odysseus in book 11. So Agamemnon was the, 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 the head of the, the Greek expedition to Troy after they conquered Troy, he returns, uh, you know, expect, expecting that, hey, you know, we really missed you. But um, Clytemnestra is there, uh, his wife, who has taken a lover, Aegisthus, and they kill him uh, when he returns. And so we see Agamemnon there warning Odysseus of the threat of this is what happens if you've been gone that long. Nothing's permanent. Nothing's permanent. So even what you think is your stable home that you have to be careful. So he's, he warns, warns him to, to not trust uh, his wife. He says uh, to be careful, try to sneak, sneak in, don't go in broad sail, you know, sneak back to the island to check it out. So this, a uh, couple of things to remember, this is part of the suspense and what's at stake when he goes back for those last, last books. But also if we think about what happened in this story, Odysseus's own story, he still has to sit on Calypso's Island for seven years thinking every day I'm gone, the risk of me losing my family and, and the suitors taking, or, or he doesn't know they're suitors, but th that risk of, of danger to my household is, is, is increasing. So that's uh, adding to his, uh, let's say, his, his pining to return home. So I want to 
end there, um, uh, I think we had a, a good discussion about some of the themes uh, today. Um, as I said, there's uh, a lot to take apart in the Odyssey as a text, uh, but if you just focus on book 11, what you read, and say your own impressions of, of, of what seemed important to you and, and, and what seemed interesting or what have you, that can be something that you might want to put in your discussion post for assignment number one. Uh, there's, and to, to go back to the question earlier, you're not required to memorize the Greek terms I was throwing at you just in terms of just trying to give you some context for those. Um, next week, we'll be reading uh, the Aeneid by Virgil, uh, uh, another great epic, uh, one of my personal favorites. So I hope you do uh, take the time to read it and enjoy it. And uh, have a great week. I'll see you next week.